Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Noteworthy, our monthly session in which we talk with uh, great musicians and about music. Uh, and thank you for joining uh, our monthly session today. Uh, this is a series, as you know, which has uh, started last month and will go on uh, this month and the following months uh, throughout this year. So do keep the dates. It's usually the last Saturday or Sunday of the month. Uh, and uh, we will also do this uh, on the 23rd of April, which is our next date. Now, a quick reminder to please go like the Facebook page where you are reviewing this uh, Facebook live session. And I also have a website which you can go to www.lalanaftasilva.com with lots of information. Now we will spend the next 90 minutes or so having conversations with our guests for today's session. Uh, and during this session, uh, it is open to you, our viewers and our friends and participants to ask questions or make comments. And you can write your questions or comments on the live chat and we'll, we'll do our best, of course, to try and respond to them. Now, we may not be able to get to all of those questions if there are lots of them, but we will certainly do our best to get to as many as possible. So please stay with us. Now, today we are so privileged to have two wonderful musicians, Rohan De Silva and Taranga Gunathilaka. Uh, today, we plan to focus mostly on the music of Ludwig van Beethoven, the famous German composer who lived from 1770 to 1827. Beethoven, as you know, for those uh, uh, who are familiar with Beethoven, he was a towering, gi towering giant in the Western music world. Now, Rohan is a world-renowned pianist and is a regular collaborator with, uh, as a pianist with Itzhak Perlman, probably one of the world's most famous violinists and certainly my favorite violinist. Rohan regularly tours all over the world with Itzhak Perlman, performing concerts in the best concert halls. And of course, I have known Rohan from the time we were youth for decades. So good to have you on the program, Rohan. Hi there to you. Nice to be here. Thank you, Lalanath, for the introduction. You're welcome. And then we also have with us Taranga Gunathilaka. Taranga is a soprano uh, and also a wonderful artist. You can see some of her artwork behind her, actually. And she's an opera singer and also performs other vocal concerts. She lives and works in New York as, and is a most promising renowned singer. And um, I have known Taranga since the time that she was in high school at Ladies College. And uh, hi to you, Taranga. Great hi. to have you on the program. Thank you, Lalana. Thanks for having me. Lovely. Um, so both Rohan and Taranga have uh, close associations uh, with the Juilliard School of Music in New York. Juilliard is one of the best and leading music schools in the world. And Rohan teaches at Julia, and Taranga did her master's of music there and also her artist diploma, which by the way, is a very challenging diploma to do. But it is best that they tell you about their own careers rather than I do so. So let me start with you, Rohan. In a nutshell, tell us how you came from Sri Lanka uh, to become the pianist you are today. Rohan. Well, I'm trying to make it in a nutshell. So um, <laughs> I left Sri Lanka when I was 16 to the Royal Academy of Music in London on an mm -hmm. Associated Woods Scholarship. I was there for six years. And then I had the privilege of coming to Juilliard um, by the assistance of the President's Fund in Sri Lanka. And I was the first um, recipient of the President's Fund Scholarship for the Arts in 1981. Mm -hmm. I was at Juilliard for four years, completing my uh, diploma, postgraduate diploma, and then the master's music. So in 85, I got out of school, but I was also very much affiliated um, in the studio of Dorothy DeLay. The late Dorothy DeLay was the foremost pedagogue of violin, and she had the most unbelievable class. And um, so I was fortunate to be in her studio as one of her studio pianists. 
while I was a student and actually I worked with her until 2002 when she passed on. So I was privileged to go through with so many young talents, incredible talents. And um, so that's how I started. And then um, your question was how I ended up with uh, Itzhak Perlman. I think there's a lot that Dorothy Dillay, she opened the doors for me. Very, never spoke about it. And uh, my Carnegie Hall debut the big auditorium was in 1987 with a Japanese violinist, Kyoko Takezawa. She had won the gold medal at the Indianapolis Violin Competition. So at that recital, there was Dorothy DeLay, Joseph Gingold, who's no more, who's also very, very wonderful pedagogy, and Itzhak Perlman sitting in the same box. I see. And I think that's how... Um, he heard me play there and I knew his daughter since she was like 12 years old at Juilliard pre-college. So I think that connection came some, somewhere, somewhere around then. And, uh, but Miss Dele has a, I have a lot of gratitude to her for opening the doors with Itzhak Perlman and other people, also other violinists. So that's in a right. nutshell. Wow, yeah, you condensed many, many decades of your life into into a few minutes, yes. Rohan. But we will we will we will probe that a little bit more as yes. we go along. Yes. Let me turn now to Taranga and ask you, Taranga, about your journey from Sri Lanka to New York. Tell us about your time in Juilliard. And of course, I know you studied music before that as well. But uh, yeah, over to you. Um, so uh, thank you, Lalunath. Um, so everything uh, began at home, really. My mom uh, was the first person who taught me to read and write music. And uh, she was a piano teacher. So I started with piano. And basically, I only did piano. I didn't really sing uh, for a long time. It felt like that way, at least. And then uh, uh, while I was continuing with my piano, I, I had the great privilege of running into uh, Mrs. Christine Pereira at Ladies College as a middle school choir, um, you know, she was the choir director and uh, she sort of found me in a way and then she had me, you know, come to her home, give me lessons, uh, have me, uh, you know, do exams and, you know, those kinds of things. So she was the one who sort of put me into the singing line and introduced me to art song. The first art song I ever sang was probably through her and uh, so that was the beginning. And then uh, I have to mention the concerto competition uh, in, uh, to, through the Symphony Orchestra of Sri Lanka. So uh, I had met uh, Miss Christine when I was around 12. And, mm -hmm. uh, and she left uh, the Sri Lanka in about three years after I met her. So I didn't have a lot of time with her, but she had prepared me with all this repertoire. So I decided, oh, I should do the competition. And that competition opened doors for me to perform with the orchestra. That resulted in uh, a few more performances with them, which included the year 2000 uh, millennial Christmas concert, it was called. Mm -hmm. And that concert was a life-changing concert for me because first of all, that was the same year I did my A-levels. So it was like a whirlwind time. Um, so I met Professor Douglas Weeks, who was a guest performer with the Sri Lanka Symphony Orchestra on the same concert. And he heard me sing at that concert and started to encourage me to really think of it as a career option. Up until then, it was always my hobby. I was planning on hopefully getting into a, a more scientific field because that was my educational background. Um, so that conversation eventually, I mean, in a nutshell again, after a lot of deliberation, had me consider going to the United States uh, to do a bachelor's degree in the university that he was affiliated with, which was uh, which is Converse College in South Carolina. So they offered me a full ride. So uh, it was very tempting. And also they let me continue with my biology studies there because it's a liberal arts college where you can, uh, you know, take classes from any uh, department. So, and then uh, again, fast forward uh, in my third year, of my undergrad, I took part in the Metropolitan Opera auditions, uh, the co council competition uh, in the South. 
and I was one of three winners that year and you know but people say you know luck is when opportunity meets preparation so it was one of those kinds of moments when the the panel of judges happened to be primarily consisting of Juilliard faculty and they asked if I had any intention of furthering my education after I finished my undergrad and then I I, I didn't have a plan. I, I actually thought I was going back to Sri Lanka. I'll start my own school of music. I had like big plans in a different direction. And then uh, uh, after that conversation happened, I went back to my school. I talked to my voice teacher, Be Dr. Beverly Hay. And she said, no, if they, you know, ask that, you should probably apply. So I did. And then I, that's how I ended up in New York because I did audition and got, got into the school. Uh, that year I was one of four people accepted to the master's program. Uh, so that was uh, how I ended up in New York. And then, of course, uh, through New York City Opera, I continued to stay on after I had finished. Wow. Wow. What a, what a, oh, what sorry, a long story. <laughs> What a wonderful and adventurous journey we both have had. I noticed that bo in both of your lives, in musical lives, your parents, uh, in your case, uh, Rohan, you didn't mention it, but I know your mother played a big role. I, I was actually, I just went straight to England. Yeah, my mother was my teacher since I was three years old when I started the piano. Indeed. And when my mom passed away when I was 14, I, I went I, to I'm, my Mrs. Moria who was teaching piano and violin. She was my violin teacher, but of course I, I, after the age of 21, after London, I never pursued the double major, which I did in uh, London. Yes, so my mother was the major influence uh, until her time of death. And then it was, uh, we all call her Auntie Mary, Mrs. Billy Moria, who yes. had the most sort of yes. fantastic school of music. And uh, so a lot goes to the, both of them. I have to say, and then my mother was a very close friend of uh, Auntie Mary. Mm -hmm. Actually, she was my mother's bridesmaid, believe it or not. So that connection was there. Right, right. Even before I was born. <laughs> no, this is wonderful. I mean, um, just thinking of my own life, my dad was very influential in my music. He was a musician himself, played the violin and, and yeah. taught me to play the recorders. So, I, you know, parents can play a very important role, even if they're not musicians, just by encouraging them, by giving them the space, by giving them the opportunity to learn music. Um, I think that's a, that's a role that parents can play. I just wanted to emphasize that. But I also noticed that in both your cases, you had some people like in your case, uh, uh, Dorothy DeLay, in, in your case, Taranga, uh, Dr. Weeks, you know, and, and uh, who, whom you met just at the right time, uh, who then gave you the push that you needed to move forward in your career. So again, I think uh, it's an interesting lesson in, in having the right people at the right time, you know, can count a lot. It, it, it goes a lot to, to progressing one's career. Um, but um, I, I want to now turn to uh, talking a little bit about um, the, 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 the composer that we've chosen for today, Ludwig van Beethoven. And as we all know, uh, uh, he, was, he was a towering giant in the Western music world. Um, and last year was his 250th birth anniversary. So we are actually focusing on him because it's an important landmark. Um, as we, uh, so a little bit about Beethoven, uh, for those of you who may not know a lot about Beethoven, Beethoven was born in 1770 and he died in 1827. He was just 57 years old and in those 57 years, uh, geez, to think that I'm even older than him now. <laughs> I mean, people lived such short lives then. Uh, but he, he wrote such a wonderful, great number of uh, compositions. He was born in Bonn, but by the time he was about 21, 22 years old, he moved to Vienna, where he then settled down and lived the rest of his life. He wrote nine symphonies, 35 piano concertos, 10 violin sonatas, and a fragment of 11th, which has now been discovered, five piano concertos, a violin concerto, a triple concerto for violin, cello, and piano. Um, he wrote 16 string quartets and uh, many overtures and, and numerous vocal uh, and choral pieces, including the great Misa Solemnis or the great solemn mass, and also the choral fantasy for piano, soloist, choir, and orchestra. 
Um, now, his life can be divided into three broad parts. The early part of his life, which is uh, which takes him from the time of his birth to the time he was 32 years old. Uh, he, he, his uh, compositions were mostly uh, of a classical nature, very similar, if you like, in character to Beethoven Haydn. But then you get to his middle period, which is from 32 to 42, that's the 10 years of his life, when he began to realize that he was going deaf. And his deafness consisted mostly of a kind of tinnitus or tinnitus, whichever you like to pronounce it, which is a constant ringing in your ears uh, or a hum or a vibration in your ears and uh, which interferes with your hearing. And for a composer, for a musician, he was also a very well-known virtuoso pianist. This was a tremendous uh, drawback, a tremendous uh, traumatic thing in his life. So that was the middle period in which he wrote many works of uh, profound importance. And, um, uh, and that is also the time in which he had just moved to Vienna. I spent about 10 years there and in which uh, he started, he, in one of the things he wrote was, is called the Heiligestadt Testament or his letter which he wrote to his brothers, Karl and Johann, in which he talks about his deafness and he says, you know, this one gift I have been given by God is now being taken away and I feel so embarrassed. I can hear or understand what people are saying. I have to pretend to hear what they're saying and so on and so forth. And also at the end of that period is this famous letter which he wrote to one of his beloveds, one of his um, women that he fell in love with. No one really knows who this is and there's a lot of scholarship and disagreement as to who he wrote this letter, but it's, it's known as the letter to his immortal beloved because that's, those are the words he uses. And so and then you get to his last period of his life, which is the, the, the final part of uh, from 42 to the time he died at 57. Um, and during that period, um, you see that there was um, uh, a lot of uh, changes actually throughout his life, a lot of changes going on throughout Europe. So you have France, you have uh, the United Kingdom, you have the United States, the Declaration of Independence happened during this period, the Constitution of the United States was uh, written at this time, the French Revolution, the uh, beheading, the guillotining of Louis XVI and his wife Marie Antoinette, lots of upheavals. Germany itself, where uh, Beethoven you know, lived and worked, was born, uh, and Austria were divided into much smaller kingdoms. There was the, the Habsburg territories in, and, and the Hungary, Austro-Hungarian uh, kingdom, etc. Which, uh, which, and then on the uh, western side of Germany, many little kingdoms, which by the end of his life had got much more consolidated into a more uh, something that looked more like the Germany of today. Italy was also divided up and it became more like the Italy of today. So a lot of changes, political, military, many conflicts throughout Europe at this time. And so he lived during a very tumultuous time and you see that, I believe, in his music. So enough of, about Beethoven and his history now. And to get started, I thought we should perhaps begin by playing an excerpt from Beethoven's first piano concerto in C major, that is Opus 15, the 15th of his work to be published. And this is from the first movement. And we have Rohan here as our soloist with the Sun Symphony Orchestra, uh, conducted by Maestro Olivier Ochenain. Now, we were all involved in this, all three of us were involved in this concert, which happened in Hanoi, Vietnam. So the Sun Symphony Orchestra is a professional orchestra in, in Vietnam. And it was organized by the Sri Lanka Embassy under the leadership of our ambassador at the time, Hassan Tidisanayake. It was a lovely concert. We had a pretty full hall and um, this excerpt is from that. So let's listen to that and then we'll come back and we'll talk about that uh, with starting with Rohan.
Thank you, Rohan, for that excerpt. Um, um, I, I, I thought I'd like to start by asking you uh, about that piece of music, the, the piano concerto. Uh, and as I listen to it, uh, you know, you, you do, do hear a lot of drama in it. There's this dialogue going on between the piano and the orchestra. Um, but I also hear uh, a strong classical style in there of Haydn, of, of, uh, of Mozart. Uh, and so give us some context for Beethoven's, you know, this concerto and what you saw as important in it and the way in which you work with the orchestra. First of all, I have to say they were great memories. We all had a fabulous time in Vietnam, uh, which was arranged by Ambassador uh, Dissanayake and then I think it was a great opportunity for all of us to get together and uh, uh, perform music. So now the Beethoven first concerto, the original, what Beethoven did was he, the second concerto in B flat was written first. And then it was the first concerto, but then, and I think the first concerto has a lot of elements from Mozart. It's, like the later Mozart concertos and you know and I think the third concerto the C minor is the one when Beethoven really developed uh, the uh, the piano and you know many uh, uh, features from uh, a, uh, using a bigger orchestra there's number one and two are mostly it's like for me it's like a Mozart concerto so so Rohan, I yeah. uh, sorry to interrupt you, but but so the first concerto was actually the second one which he second wrote, one. yes, and the second that. concerto was the first that he wrote, though they were published in the reverse order, right? Yes, and then the fourth and the fifth, the emperor is the is the fifth. major uh, king, I think, of the five concertos for piano and orchestra. The also the fourth and the fifth. The fourth starts with the piano, a little introduction, and mm -hmm. has a very long tutti, right? The fifth one starts with the E flat major chord, and then it could, the piano comes in with like cadenza kind of thing, and then has a huge tutti. The first also has a big tutti before the piano enters. I think some of those characteristics uh, are very important. So, and the C minor, of course, number three has yeah. an introduction. To T, and then you start with the C minor scale, four right. octaves, and uh, that's how he composes yeah. the rest of the piece. I mean, the typical yeah. classical style you had uh, in a concerto, you had an introduction, a two T, as you say, uh, of yes. the orchestra introducing the themes, and then you had the soloist coming in uh, later on. But in that sense, the emperor is different. He made a, a dramatic change and he brings the soloist right at the beginning. In fact, the whole concerto starts with the soloist with a big point. Absolutely. Chord. Yeah. So, so he was he was experimenting with new things right. and introducing right. new ideas. Yeah, uh, no, this is fantastic. Um, the, you know, as uh, I, I'm sure you, I mean, and there's no question you're familiar also with uh, his piano sonatas. And uh, throughout them, do you see? I mean, t t talk us through a little bit of the way in which he he you see him maturing through his compositions uh, and his three periods of his life. Well. Well, we discussed it earlier on when you said that there are three periods, right? And the early sonatas, the early opus numbers, just like the violin sonatas, you know, uh, uh, they fall into one category and the middle part of his life and then the big sonatas, the more uh, uh, symphonic sounding works like the late Beethoven sonata starting at opus 101, 106, the Hammerklavier, 109, 110 and 111. I think those are the monumental works of, for the mm -hmm. piano, which were composed in the latter part of his life. So the early sonatas still has a lot of um, his qualities taken from like Mozart or, mm -hmm. you know, not as full and uh, uh, what, what can I say? It's not, um, not like playing in a, with an orchestra you know, the orchestral quality, the symphonic um, right. texture. And uh, 
I think in the middle period is when he started developing and then getting more into the, uh, his really, his identity of yeah. the work. Right. You know. No, I think that's a very important point. I think many composers start off uh, either in the style of their teachers or in the style of what uh, they are hearing around them. And then gradually they, they mature into uh, developing their own separate identity, their own uh, voice, if you like, Absolutely. In, in which they speak. And uh, you're right. I mean, uh, when Haydn, I mean, when Beethoven moved to Vienna, uh, and when he was around his uh, early 20s, he actually took lessons from, from Haydn. Uh, and he, of course, he, he was, uh, he, he met and, uh, you know, knew about Haydn, uh, Mozart as well. And he also took lessons from Sarieri, who unfortunately got very maligned after that, after the famous right. film, Medias. But Salieri was a very well-known and respected composer at his time. And he was, you know, and so Beethoven took lessons from both of them. And so his early style is definitely, you know, you see a very strong classical uh, characteristic to it. Right. But I, I mean, uh, going back to the first piano country, you you still do hear that that very special kind of Beethoven's drama, this the spots yes. and chords, the 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 sudden crush, you know crescendos to a to a to a big chord, you know, which come in very dramatically, shake you up. And even uh, the and, drama is even on the third movement, I think, mm -hmm. and all yeah. these uh, uh, the middle section of the uh, concerto when it goes into. Um, a minor, ta -ra -ra -ram -pum, ta -ra -ra -ram -pum, you know, all yeah. this Fort Sandals on the offbeat and all. Then he introduces all that in the third movement, which is also very dramatic. Indeed, indeed. You know, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, very good. I, I, I want to turn to Taranga now. Uh, and Taranga, so, uh, you know, we, we know that Beethoven went through this traumatic period in his life when he realized, in the middle period of his life, when he started realizing he was going deaf. And uh, and uh, you know had to deal with this. Uh, it's like a pianist losing your hands, you know, or a dancer losing your legs. You know, just imagine uh, it, it's it's a terrible thing. And um, and so you know, as a composer, I can I, I I can't even begin to imagine what what a terrible place to be in uh, in that situation. Um, but um, uh, you know, he apparently even com contemplated suicide. But he was also a strong believer in a uh, kind of uh, you know moral rectitude and so that kept him from 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 committing suicide um, um, uh, but in a sense the more deaf he got the more profound his works become the more dramatic the more uh, typical Beethoven it becomes that his last string quartets are just an amazing transition into the next period of music which is the romantic period what do you think happened? Did you think because he got cut off from the rest of the world, he couldn't hear his contemporaries' music and so was able to look inward and become more his authentic self? Or do you think something else was going on? And, and do, you, I mean, do you have some insights or thoughts around that? So, um, I mean, just like you said, uh, it is impossible to believe that it wasn't traumatic for any per person, whether they were a musician or not, to just imagine going deaf at any point in their lives, right? So in addition to those, uh, you know, imaginable trauma, I feel that in Beethoven's case, from the time of his childhood, he had this external force of his father and the environment that he grew up in uh, with a lot of chatter about like the expectation of what he was ex to be like his dad wanted him to be the next uh, child mozart and so on so uh, i'm not saying that the chatter completely got shut off because he went deaf but i'm sure it did help him to internalize or to listen to his inner voice more if he couldn't really hear this all the time. You have, you have to realize that when he moved to Vienna in 1792, uh, Mozart had just uh, like passed, you know, and Viennese loved Mozart even more than when Mozart was alive. Uh, also knowing that, you know, Giovanni was, uh, Don Giovanni was performing in Prague, which was a big success in 91. So like, he comes into this backdrop where the shadow was, couldn't be even bigger. 
of the Mozart's shadow on him. So the expectation was great. However, within a few years of him being in Vienna, he does become known as the most sought after pianist of the time. Mm -hmm. So not, I mean, we always think of Beethoven the composer, Beethoven the composer, but like to him, his, his showmanship being on stage was a big deal. So for him, I think the greatest trauma may have been the fact that going deaf, not necessarily did it prevent him from composing, but it prevented him from being the performer he, need, he, he desired to be. And, mm -hmm. and that's probably the reason why he didn't write more than five piano concerti, because he's a pianist and he loved collaborating with the orchestra and you can't collaborate if you can't hear. And here. So, but Sonatas, he went on to write more because he didn't need to necessarily collaborate. He wrote 32 or 35 Sonata yeah. because he could still play as long as he could kind of, kind of feel the vibrations, the, the quality of the piano, etc. So that, uh, I think, the idea, the notion that the more he realizes that his deafness wasn't really going to go away, it wasn't uh, something that can be, uh, you know, uh, cured, uh, I think the realization of him slowly moving away from being a performer at his peak, you know, at his best time, he realizes that that's when he has to quit was a big deal. However, uh, going back to what you said earlier about the letters that he wrote to his brothers, you know, like he's, he's yes, he's, he did contemplate taking his own life, but he does say that he, the reason that keeps him from not you know, going there is his art. And when he refers to that, I believe that he's talking about composing because right. he had so much to say through his music that he couldn't end his life. So co composition, in fact, actually saves him from his trauma. That is my, my, my take. I right. No, that's, that's, that's a great insight, actually. Now, a lot of people talk about Beethoven and, this, and, and all of the things that went on around him, the political changes, the fact that, for example, his third symphony, the Eroica symphony, he, he had dedicated to uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. And then when Bonaparte crowned himself as the emperor, uh, all his ideas of democracy and the rights of man and declaration of the rights of man and so on, which, he, which Beethoven believed in, was shattered because this man was no different to any other dictator in the end you know he had crowned himself as emperor so he apparently tore off this front page and made a dedication instead to a viennese uh, viennese nobleman now there is some new research showing that maybe he was upset but the, the new dedication was much more in a sense because he wanted to you know be seen as a favor a fa you know be favorable be seen favorably by the nobility of vienna because he was just making his life uh, life in vienna but be that as it may, you know, all, he did write things like Egmont, the Egmont Overture and incidental music to Egmont and Prometheus and so on, on in all of which clearly there is a lot of political statements being made, uh, you know, in through his music. But I want to come back to this, this inner part of his life in which we know that he adopted his brother's uh, 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 son, his nephew, and uh, tried to, you know, make him a pianist. Uh, maybe try to achieve through him what he was now no longer able to achieve. And this resulted in a very bad relationship developing between him as a stepfather and, you know, the adoptive father and, and, and this nephew. And it ended up in, a, you know, they eventually uh, uh, got upset and angry with each other and his nephew left the home and, uh, but would come back to ask for money. And this was a really, really very bad relationship. So um, do you think that in a sense, some of this inner struggles that were going on was playing, you know, was playing out through his relationship with his nephew. And how did that might have that have affected his compositions? Well, we do know that during the, the worst time with this custody battle and the, the relationship issues with the nephew, what we know historically is that he didn't compose. So which was not OK. You know, obviously it was not a good time. For Beethoven. I mean, well, we can't really say that he did not, because at least we don't know if he did. But because he also, Mozart, unlike Mozart and, you know, Haydn and composers like that, who produced like much bigger numbers of works, like, you know, like Haydn 100 symphonies, you know, it's like, it's like Beethoven wrote in like, 
little bits, you know, on sketch paper. So maybe he, he was doing that the entire, those five to six years that he didn't, we say didn't write, but it takes time for Beethoven to kind of put the puzzle together compared to someone like Mozart who would write a sonata in an in a afternoon. So it doesn't make one better than the other. It's just the style was different. So maybe to bring about the Ninth Symphony, those years of sort of passive looking uh, years of, to us were in fact the most active internally. We don't know that, but if we could assume given the way he writes that right. you know, there was a, there's a lot of like scratches of paper with all kinds of notations revised and revised and revised. And uh, so I do believe that there was a lot of brewing within that time. So he doesn't compose a whole lot after that at all. So, and you know, that was the end of his career in a way after, you know, the ninth was done. And so um, I find it interesting that the, that that time uh, did pause him from producing more. However, to, uh, to comment on what you said about, was he trying to relive, you know, like sort of uh, the way his dad was to him. Uh, I mean, that could be one way of thinking a bit of it. At the same time, he also, I believe has a lot of respect for his mother. Uh, at the same time, he feels like his mother couldn't really protect him from his father. So mm -hmm. when he saw the, the a mother left with a child again, without the father character or someone to protect the child, he may have also wanted to actually give protection to a child because he finds the female character in, in to, the, to, his, to the best of his knowledge that was not in a position to take care of a child so it could have been that sort of view as well yeah no uh, you're right i mean beethoven uh, beethoven uh, unlike mozart who as you said would sit down on an afternoon and you know scribble off a sonata i mean uh, or, 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 or a, um, you know perhaps even a concerto uh, beethoven on the other hand uh, struggled with when I say struggle, I mean in a positive, constructive right. way. He would make notes. He would revise his themes, his melodies, his harmonies over and over and over again until he was fully satisfied before he actually uh, put it into the score. So, so it's a very different form of composition. So the number of com compositions compared to Mozart or Haydn is much less, but they're perhaps of a different quality, of a different right. depth. And so um, it's a very different way of composing. And you can have composers of both styles and there's nothing wrong or right about them. It's just very different. And one has to take account of that. Now, I know Taranga, you've chosen something to sing for us, which is Ish Libadish, and which is really a love song. I know it basically says, I love you. This was an early uh, uh, song that, uh, that uh, Beethoven wrote. And uh, thank you, Rohan, for uh, collaborating with Taranga on this on the piano. And um, let's play that, and then uh, and then we can talk about the the song itself. Um. <laughs> Oh, 
Uh, thank you, Taranga. That was lovely. Thank you, Rohan. Um, I, I do want to remind our friends and our participating listeners to please, if you have questions or comments, do write them in the chat and we will then definitely try to respond to them or bring them into the discussion. Please participate. I encourage you all to, to uh, I'm sure you have uh, questions or thoughts in your mind as we was, we, we've been speaking and listening to this music. So please do write it in the chat if you have, have would like to share them with us. Um, so uh, to go back to the song that we just heard, uh, Taranga, um, uh, to tell us a little bit about that song and what you see as you know from a from a compositional point of view as as important to, to for a singer to understand this piece, or for that matter any song that you know Beethoven might have written. Um, uh, so uh, this song, uh, I mean, yes, it's called Ich liebe dich, but I think originally it was uh, called Sterliche Liebe, which means like the tender love. Uh, it's the title. And uh, the poet, uh, the way the poet interprets it and the way Beethoven interprets it may be different. So um, we don't know exactly how the poet necessarily wanted it to be, uh, you know, interpreted, but Clearly, when I perform a piece, whether it's by Beethoven or someone else, I try to fit into what the composer probably wants uh, the, the text to sort of bring out. Um, so in this, the very first phrase is all I'm going to talk about, only because every phrase has its own nuance. And uh, it's a very simple poetry of love. And what it's, the, the very first line, what it says, Ich liebe dich, so wie du mich. Uh, am Abend und am Morgen, which means uh, I I love you uh, as you love me, as in there's like an evenness, a balance, mm -hmm. and uh, in the in the e uh, in the evening and in the morning, that's what it says. So uh, so if you if I learned my part just in a literal sense, it feels like oh it's a joyful love love song, very you know youthful maybe. Um, so. And if you take it in G major, like I'll just play like a chord G major. Um, there, so uh, it's a nice key and everything. And typically, if you literally meant it in that melodic material, you would probably sing. Ich liebe dich so wie du mich. You know, so it's like a, the natural ba bass would flow to like a five, one to five. Uh, and that's exactly what Beethoven does. But he uh, uses the five in a way that he uses the most unstable of the uh, bass motion of the fifth chord so that you're not quite satisfied when you say it. So it's Ich liebe dich so wie du bist am Abend und am which informs me as a singer, this is not as simple as I love you as much as I, you love me. Like the, the balance is a little off. So it just gives you a certain feeling of nuance. And we have to realize that this is Beethoven when he's like 25. It's not Beethoven later. So this is the same right. time that the first piano concerto was written. So he's this like bubbling little ball, which is trying to burst out and show off oh, what yeah. he has inside. So uh, you can feel it at the get go, although it sounds like, you know, in, this, in the, 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 the very fundamentals, it's very classical, but you can see this sprouting Beethoven, you know, in the same way, I, I also find that it's similarly in the first piano concerto too, like, although he's in the very standard concerto form, he creeps in like, Things like the the lago, right, Rohan? Like you know, he, he the second movement is usually on the fourth, uh, the, the subdominant or dominant key of the C major, which would have been F or G, as opposed to A flat, which it goes into. Uh, very weird for the time. So and bringing out the wind instruments more in the concerto than he does the strings, which would have been strings would have been the the normal thing to do at the period. So as a person writing in 1795-ish, it's, it's a little strange and that strangeness is what develops into Ninth Symphony. You know, that is already present, the uniqueness 
is very present when you really like look at it. So I, I find that very fascinating. And Beethoven was always Beethoven. I mean, he doesn't become the Beethoven later. You know, he just becomes more confident and free, perhaps. I also think that even in the first concerto, the second movement, which is in the uh, in A flat major, has some kind of sadness. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, that he portrays because I think at that time he was having this the ear was giving him problems. I mean, he wasn't deaf, but he had this ringing of the ear when he was writing some of this stuff. And uh, for instance, by the fourth concerto, you know, that beautiful second moment of the piano concerto, there's a lot of trauma, a lot of sadness in his phrasing and his mm -hmm. uh, approach to the music. You know, I, I was thinking of, uh, just as you were talking, the Moonlight Sonata, right? The first moment, it's a very sad melody. And then the drama is in the last moment, last moment yes. you know, so th this is one of his characteristics and uh, more he uh, developed his deafness and he was getting frustrated. So he was going crazy. And uh, most of the writing has all this uh, uh, dramatic and uh, sort of, you know, that kind of, uh, uh, right. That kind of uh, view in most of his, music i yeah. think towards the second half and the the period number two and three and three is very evident right you know? now, i i had the privilege of visiting uh, his home uh, in bonn when i when i was in bonn and uh, upstairs is uh, is one of his pianos uh, which was used during his lifetime and, uh, the, if you, and of course, there's a glass pad over it so that people don't go and touch the keys. But the keys are all worn out. And I remember asking one of the curators there, why, why is it so worn out? And, it, and, and the explanation was that he used to bang on it so hard because he could not hear. And he would often stand up and put his ear to the top of the piano so that he could hear more probably through, uh, through the vibrations that may have being able to transmit through the bone structure more than through the ear. Uh, so, so obviously he, he was, he was really struggling to hear what he was writing and, uh, and these chords that come, you know, the swat sandals are probably also part of his, his just his, his desire to be heard and his, his inner voice to be heard. Um, I, I, I want to take this opportunity uh, to also ask both of you about preparation for say if you're doing a concert or a recording you know and the amount of time you actually put in to uh, to practicing to rehearsing with whomever you're collaborating with um, uh, give, give us a sense of what it is as a professional musician to and how much time you actually spend on things like this uh, maybe we can start with Rohan and then after that Taranga well preparation is something you take very seriously, depending on what the program is. There are times where you get a piece that you have never played and you have, to, you have two weeks to prepare it. So then you do a little bit of research, listen to one or two recordings, never copy the recording, mm -hmm. just to get an idea. So you're looking at a piece that you have never played. So you go into it like looking at a painting. You go from to, to it from outside and you get the structure of the work. And then once you have got an idea, and of course the style of the composer, then you look into the minor details, but it needs a little time. And most of these days, oh, well, when we had concerts, and now it's starting back little by little, um, you are performing works that you have played quite a few times. And of course, then you have to make sure that you don't get stale with the piece that you have played for 15 years that you have to bring something new to the work. So, and how do you do that? Not always easy to make it fresh. You, you are uh, depicting a story, you're telling a story to the listeners, but the story should, could never be the same always. So you must never play a piece. That's just the way I look at it. Mm -hmm. You must never uh, repeat the story. It has to be something different, something that you're going to add to it, which makes it more interesting for you personally and for the audience. Because sometimes you're, you know, uh, 
you are uh, you don't want to get stale with something so the preparation is vital and also when you're preparing with somebody that you have played for a long time i think it is very important first of all you have this um, uh, bond you have the mutual respect for each other i'm just talking about two people and this is something that's very important and you got to know the music very well you got to know the other person's part equally well you got to know your colleague's part equally well and i think it works vice versa if you are playing with a singer or a uh, instrumentalist or anyone that person also should know the piano part really well not just but where they are, they are studying from the score i think it's important to study from the score it's not it's not the only thing to practice all the time in a practice room from your own part and not read the score you should be practicing from the score or mentally practicing so this is something that i have learned over the years and i apply that uh, to whatever i'm doing you know and maybe taranga can you know yeah. taranga do you have about how she I mean, rohan pretty much said everything but i i uh, from a singer's perspective like uh, i mean if you're preparing for a recital as opposed to an opera there are differences of course right um because when it is recital you're most likely with only one pianist but if you're in an opera setting you're with uh, a lot of like there's the orchestra and every single character that you're uh, interacting with and singing with so and any interaction means that you're not just you you're you're responsible for your part as well as for everybody else involved so you really need to know the work like rohan said as it is on the score so that is i wouldn't call it practice it's actually a study so if you have to be willing to study the score if you want to perform otherwise there's a lot missing in your performance and i think a lot of times very young uh, uh, students may not see the importance of it but they will over time with experience and everything and then when you're learning a new song or an aria uh for me personally i prefer to learn my text before everything else because the text could mean so many different things when you have not necessarily learned the music yet because the music gives you more information subconsciously than you would want to in a way which may hinder your own voice so you want to kind of just do the text so to understand okay what does it mean to me so that you can bring your authentic voice to the piece so that no two singers actually would interpret the same thing the same way uh so that again brings the freshness that rohan talks about nobody wants to see the same thing repeated on stage and then if you're working on a piece that you've done many many times i actually find that place that you come to where you're kind of you've done everything you can to it it's a really good place because then you know whatever that comes over it is going to create a certain magic you know because right. it's you know where where can you take and then i like to sing the piece in a different key because that sort of triggers other things in a person uh, just for fun you know in the practice room or change like change the rhythm into like a little bit like a a compound rhythm like if it's like a simple rhythm and just sing the words those things just trigger your brain in ways that one cannot explain mm -hmm. and the new ideas pop it's uh so just just playing around with the piece that you're so familiar is very important um you know so those are things that i do uh to keep things fresh and uh, interesting for myself therefore it will hopefully translate that excitement to the audience no those are great insights so we do have two questions i'm going to pose the questions so that you can think about them uh, <laughs> and while you think about them we are going to play the next piece which Uh, is actually a collaboration between Rohan and this young but wonderful virtuoso violinist Kevin Zhu, uh, and we'll talk about that piece also in a minute. But this is uh, from Beethoven's Violin Sonata Number no. One in D, uh, and it's the third movement. So while we're playing that, I want you to think about these two questions that have come in. One is from Lianga de Silva. and the question is how did beethoven's compositions influence his contemporaries or those who came after him so that's one question 
And the second one is from Shiranti. Uh, if you could ask Beethoven to write a piece of music from any genre, what would you ask? So those are two questions. Think about them. And let's now listen to this violin uh, sonata. Actually, it's, it's, it says sonata for piano and violin. And Rohan will talk a little bit more about this later. But uh, this is the third movement with Kevin Zhu on violin and Rohan on, on piano.
Wow, <laughs> that was a lovely performance. It really enjoyable. It was, uh, such a uh, upbeat and uh, ebullient and uh, 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 spirited performance. Tell, uh, before we get to these questions, Ron, tell us a little bit about that piece and about Kevin. I know he won a prize recently, didn't he? Yeah, well, yeah. he's just 20 years old and uh, I've had the privilege of working with him since October, actually. And uh, he's an extraordinary talent. I mean, he, he won the Menuhin competition, the junior division, I believe he was 11. Um, and then he won the Paganini competition uh, in Genoa, Italy, when he was 17. So he's at the ripe old age of 20 now. And he just won, he was one of the winners for the Avery Fisher Career Grant to wow. Mexico. So, which is a big honor for these uh, emerging artists to uh, help with their careers. And uh, it's, uh, these awards are given every year there's a big panel of uh, artists and uh, record engineers, managers who recommend people. Mm -hmm. And I believe this year we had five, uh, uh, two violinists, a uh, cellist, pianist, and I think there was actually, I think there were three violinists actually. Um, anyway, this guy, um, you know, this was, that recording was a live performance. Yes, yes. And when you're doing live, of course, during the pandemic, as you see, my page turner, who is also a violinist, was yes, wearing the mask. mask. So only yes. for the performance, when we were recording it live, we did not wear the mask. Even at rehearsals, we are wearing the masks and doing the social mm -hmm. distancing, the whole shit. So, you know, I think these days, because of this pandemic, things have not been easy for any of us, especially performing and, you know, everything has been taken away. But we are starting little by little of doing uh, concerts, but obviously not in public, mm -hmm. you know. But on April 8th, Kevin and I are doing uh, a concert for the public uh, at Lincoln Center, which is called Storewide Concerts. You're playing inside this uh, empty space through the glass and the uh, generosity of a uh, major foundation um, uh, called the Alpha Dine Foundation has been having concerts and passes by and the public, they're just listening to it from a wonderful sound system that has been installed outside. So you're inside the, inside this glass uh, area. So I think things are standing. I mean, they, we had singers, uh, instrumentalists, pianists, and it's a different concept, which is really great for the uh, people, uh, all musicians who have been, you know, their, their careers have stopped. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I hope this will help mm -hmm. all of us. I think it's helping a lot of us who have been, uh, you know, everything's been taken away, but there's light at the end of the tunnel. That's the most important thing. Indeed. Yeah. indeed. No, no. So this oh. movement, sorry, I, I diverted my uh, thoughts, uh, is the rondo where you get the theme going, coming over and over again. And it's a very happy movement, as you can hear. And it's in the key of D major. So I think at this time, it was, it was an orchestral number one, which the early part of Beethoven. He was not a sad man. He was not going through struggles at that point. So I think there's a lot of vivaciousness and uh, just uh, spiteful character in this piece throughout the whole movement. Uh, Rohan, he wrote 10 violin sonatas. And yeah, there's 10 sonatas for piano and violin because yeah, the piano important. is... Yeah, he, that's very important for people. I, I, I to wanted know. to ask you about this. So so people sometimes say, oh, the piano was accompanying the soloist or the piano was accompanying the flutist. Yes. And I know you get very upset by that. And I get very mad. And, 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 <laughs> and here Beethoven is actually writing a sonata and he's saying sonata for piano and violin, not yes, because violin of, and piano. And correct. that's just significant. And so does Mozart. Actually, all the sonatas written for, uh, uh, they are written for piano and violin, Brahms, Beethoven, Mozart, Schubert. It's all, it's written specifically for, because they were all pianists and piano played a important role. And actually sometimes the piano has much more stuff to do with than even the violin in some of the Mozart sonatas. They're like concertos, the la later ones, you know? So, uh, 
it's important for people to know these are not accompaniments. Accompaniments uh, are, I think, more, uh, more related to vocal songs, you know, um, that Taranga can ex uh, explain that, I'm sure, much better than I could. But these, uh, and the short pieces for violin, uh, where the violinist is showing off their pyrotechnics, etc. Mm -hmm. But the sonatas are dua duos, they are equal partnerships, especially these big works, you know, and uh, those composers really uh, went to the maximum when they were using the piano and the, uh, they are uh, composing and making the piano stand out. Right. And, so, uh, so that's why the word collaboration is a better descriptor. Much better description, yes. Because it shows that you understand that both instruments are yes. of equal importance and play an equally important role in the, in the Absolutely. composition. So this particular work that you just heard, Beethoven's first uh, violin sonata, was actually written, as, as you said, Rohan, in his early period, and at the time when he was actually Haydn's, uh, the, a student of Haydn. And in fact, he dedicated it to Antonio Salieri, which is, which is again very interesting, just shows how important Salieri was at that time, yes. not only to Beethoven, but as a composer. Um, I want to try to get to these questions now. And so um, I, I want to ask, I, I know Taranga that our next, our next piece that we're going to play is actually a song by Schubert, uh, which is uh, who was who was clearly influenced by Beethoven, was a contemporary of Beethoven, and so in some ways uh, you can respond to Lianga's question about the influence of Beethoven as you as we talk about that piece. But perhaps you can take the other questions first. So Shiranti is asking you if you were, if Beethoven was alive today, what would you, if you had a choice of commissioning him to write something, what would you ask him to write, and why would you do that? Well, I mean, from a singer's perspective, I think it's an obvious answer. <laughs> well, he did write one opera, but I would ask him to go for another, <laughs> <laughs> only because I'm just curious. Um, as to what may have happened if he had tried another, you know, because yeah. I think the reasons why he wrote the Fidelio was not the same reasons that other opera composers wrote their operas. They wanted to use the beauty of the voice in certain characters, but Beethoven was more like, you know, in that mode of political influence, using the, inst uh, the voice a lot more like, uh, you know, an instrument to convey his point of view in a... Uh, almost a rebellious manner, a kind of feminist, you know, the, the, the thought process was different when he approached Fidelio compared to other who we consider great opera um, uh, composers. So I, I wonder if over time, if he had sort of just written an opera for the sake of writing an opera, maybe, I don't know how to, how to describe it, but it, maybe it would have been different. So I, I might have just, you know, had that uh, be given another chance. Uh, not mm -hmm. that Fidelio is bad, but I'm just saying uh, he, right. he didn't go very well the first time around and he had to revise it like and then even afterwards it was a success but you know it, there was not a whole lot of positive response around the, the opera so uh, I, I think he's capable of uh, right. bringing something even greater you know. So. Well, another opera by Beethoven would certainly be a great addition to, I mean, clearly he was making a political statement through Fidelio yes, and he yes. was living, as we, as we discussed earlier, during two marchous times. Uh, Stephen Sarkovsky is a good friend of mine. He's a conductor and also a cellist uh, uh, in the DC area and travels around, uh, has a comment on what you just said about collaborations, uh, Rohan. And he says, uh, uh, he says uh, and this is, he says, particularly with the cello sonatas, it's true, the third and fourth and fifth cello sonatas are true, true collaborations, and and that affirms the point that you made. Thank you, Stephen, for that comment. Um, and, uh, Rohan, do, if you were to ask Beethoven today to write something, what would it be? Uh, listen, he's written some five fantastic cello sonatas. Well, for piano and cello, right? Piano, even number one is all piano. Of course, cello has something to do. Number two, G minor is all arpeggios running on the keyboard, but the cello has this wonderful introduction, like a question and answer, and then number three, famous A major, then four is a two movement sonata, very interesting. And the fifth one, D major, has the fugue, which is so complicated, fantastic writing, but very complicated to play, very difficult for piano. But, you know, in, uh, 
what will I ask Beethoven to write? He, other than the Beethoven triple concerto, which is a cello concerto pretty much, and a violin is no easy either. I would like to have tell Tony write a cello concerto, right? right. He, got, he wrote the most beautiful violin concerto, which is a monumental work and so difficult to play. Even if you are in your forties, people attempt it when they are very young. But I think you have to have some kind of experience in life. life experience, life experience, life more. experience to play that piece. I know these young ones; they all play, mm -hmm. but it's very few great performances of it. From he, he did write the triple concerto for violin, cello, and piano and orchestra. Yes, uh, but, but cello, cello, has like, a cello is like up there, right. you know, playing like a violin pretty much. Yeah, uh, well, now you do. Piano, you do you do play the cello as well. You used to play oh, the cello as well. I wouldn't talk about that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would use it as just a so second I, study for like I, nine years. Right. But, I, can, uh, I can fully understand why you would ask Beethoven to write a cello concerto. I mean, I think that would be a wonderful addition to, to the repertoire. Yes. Yeah. Um, let, let, let me also ask, so uh, uh, Rajiv Aloysius, I think you both know him, has, uh, has this know. question. Do you have a very special or memorable Beethoven experience in your career? Or please share a most treasured ex career experience around the world. It's, so it could be Beethoven, it could be something else, but something that really you, you treasured and you remember from your, from your uh, careers. Uh, Rohan, go for us. You know, <laughs> sorry, for me, I think every concert that I've been play with my colleague, it's a problem, is treasured mm -hmm. because, because of who he is and what a, what a revered artist, but that's a real artist. I mean, you're in seventh heaven. So whether you play at Carnegie Hall or whether you play at Kennedy Center, yeah, one of the concerts that I played with him and Pinker Zuckerman, uh, fabulous artist. I mean, this was at uh, Carnegie Hall three years mm -hmm. ago, was a very rare appearance by two of the greatest artists living. That was very a special moment. Mm -hmm. And another moment for me was at the White House for President Obama and Michelle Obama, when Mr. Perman and I were invited to play for them. And, uh, you know, it's not all now, you, you, you played at the White House several right. times. I mean, I remember you played uh, during the time when George uh, Bush's time, George Bush Jr. Queen, was, and Queen Elizabeth's state visit, right. and the state, we were at the state dinner also. And so did uh, for President Obama and Michelle Obama when Shimon Perez was uh, given the Medal of Freedom by mm -hmm. President Obama. It, they were uh, special moments, very important moments that you will never forget. Thank you. Thank you, Rohan. And Taranga, what about you? So, I mean, there are several, for several different reasons, you know, like sometimes special performances. Pick a couple. Pick a couple of them. Yeah. So, let, let, I'll, I'll mention two, maybe. Um, so, one was when I made my very first appearance with the New York City Opera. So, I... I, I sang a very, like, not a, not the lead, you know, like a secondary role, like a resi in intermezzo. When I walk on that stage, like, I couldn't believe I was there, you know. It was one of those moments that, you know, like, Beverly Seals walked there and Kiri has walked there. I mean, it's just one of those, like, strange feelings that you feel so humbled, like, in a way that you're so little in this big place, you know. So, and it's, it's amazing that feeling and then you actually don't need that kind of strange pressure and courage because you're just standing there and letting the music happen. It's, it's, it's something that you can't really describe. I mean, that was like, I, I would never forget that first moment, you know, that's one. And uh, the other is when I performed actually um, at the Julia Theatre once, uh, the, the Dialogues of the Carmelite. So that piece is very dear to my heart. And I never thought I'll ever get cast in that role for many reasons, actually. But 
I did, and uh, as as Blanche, and that's a very sort of spiritual plus worldly, like a lot of like I resonate with that piece very much. So, and then to sing with a cast that was so absolutely perfect, I would say. I mean, I was very fortunate to be in that group, and uh, I would never forget it. And uh, oh, I have to mention one more. So when I uh, performed. Uh, at Stratomo, actually, like in DC, mm -hmm. uh, this was again one of those strange kind of collaborations where uh, I was one of the soloists and the conductor was Lauren Mazel, and there, this was Mendelssohn, uh, and there were narrators involved, and the narrators were Helen Mirren and Jeremy Irons. So it was like whoa, it, like a very strange, you know group of people on that stage and then to have witnessed it from that perspective from the stage those are memorable you know like very um uh, experiences that take you away from thinking of you you know which is beautiful and, and, and do 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 t t a quick question before we get to Lianga's question, and and then maybe we should go to the Schubert in a minute. But uh, do do you both feel nerves? I mean, I know lots of students talk about nerves and excitement before they go on stage. Tell us a little bit. I mean, I uh, I I'm speaking personally for myself. I always feel that a little bit of nerves, a little bit. I mean, uh, ex there should be excitement before you go on the stage, and a little bit of nerves can actually be a good thing. Uh, although a lot of nerves could actually sometimes be, uh, you know, a downer. So, so t tell us a little bit, share with, with our audience a little bit about nerves and excitement. So, I'm going to go first. Yeah, go nerves, ahead. of course, we all get nervous. We are human. But if you have done the proper preparation in advance, you're going to have a little bit of uh, adrenaline your stomach or your hands or knees or whatever but you know you've done the work so that's i call it good nerves but if you have not done the work as you're supposed to do then you know that's a different kind of nerves and I, I generally try and avoid that because i i'm kind of prepared pretty much and uh, there are some situations where you had to jump in and replace someone because of whatever uh, and you know you have all this three days notice, two days notice, but then you undertake that and you're completely responsible and then you, you know, just do it. Of course you're nervous. Every artist is nervous. Even the greatest ones are nervous, but they are, the fund, foundation is so strong. You might know you're nervous. Hopefully the audience will never know you're nervous. Most of the time you, they don't, but you might have some butterflies, but that's just for a few minutes. And that excitement, as Laranath said, always helps uh, to make the performance even better. And I think that's that's what, how I feel. And Taranga, do you feel the same? Oh, I definitely feel the same. Uh, and I, I was going to say the same thing about preparation is the channel to that good kind of nervous. And I can't imagine... Like I'm so afraid of the other kind of nervous that I I that alone will make me prepare, <laughs> you know. So it's like uh, I I can't imagine being in that place. The other good nervous is something that I want, you know. I think without that, there's a certain lack of energy, and I find that to be the case sometimes with these online performances. There's a slight uh, less of that good energy now. Uh, and I, I, I yearn for it, you know, like, I, I, I don't know what, but it's because there's no live audience, you know, when there's people watching like physically, that nervous energy is more, which I like, again, that is the good kind of nervous energy, the excitement, and, and, uh, but just to, uh, for me personally, and I'm, I, I have a feeling it might be the same for Rohan, one, when you just step on the stage, that conversion happens, that the conversion of, the performing mode where the energy travels into a place where you desire for it to travel to and mm -hmm. uh, you know that it happens as i mean the number of times you walked onto the stage it, it sort of you know promises that that is going to be the case uh, given that you're prepared you know so uh, yeah so yeah if someone says they're not nervous that's really not true <laughs> I, I totally agree i totally agree if somebody tells you you're not nervous they are just kidding 
you know, if somebody walks on stage thinking that they are not nervous, hey, better be careful what's going to come out of it, you know? <laughs> um, and I have to say, over the years, I think the older people like us playing on those concert stages for a while, also, I think you know how to deal with it uh, better than the younger uh, up and coming uh, artists, um, especially after this during this pandemic, because a lot of people, everybody, all of us have not played concerts. But I think people of our age group, my age group, we can deal with it by seeing the public because we are eager to play. Whereas some of the, I'm only guessing, younger people don't know how to deal with it because they just th things have been just taken away after you know they're playing in public suddenly they have to play in public or do a recording that's a that's a whole different ball game so i think there are a lot of there could be issues but you've got to know how to handle it handle them yeah no all very good points so i think it's time we have about 10 minutes left on this program and what i'd like to do now is to uh, play our next excerpt which is a song by schubert Let's listen to this song and then we can talk about it. Schubert uh, lived at the same time, he was a contemporary of Beethoven, lived in the same city in Vienna. And in fact, both of them shared 31 years of their life uh, in Vienna. Was, uh, they, they, they were passing each other. Obviously, they probably even met, met each other. Now, Schubert, it turns out, had a kind of love-hate relationship with Beethoven uh, in that he was clearly influenced by Beethoven. Uh, was really intimidated because it was, you know, all composers who came after Beethoven felt as if they were, in, you know, struggling to come out of his shadow and become their own, right? Because he was such a towering giant. Um, but at the same time, so in a letter, for example, he writes that Beethoven's music, I mean, in, in his own diary, he writes. So this was personal to himself. It's not, he didn't say this in public, but obviously it came to light after he died, that Beethoven's music was bizarre and was a fusion between the tragic and the comic. Now this, you know, it's, it's, it's almost as if Salieri was speaking through Schubert, because you know, Schubert, he also took lessons from Salieri. So um, uh, it, it's, it's an interesting relationship, but clearly Schubert was influenced. And we'll talk about that influence in response to Lianga de Silva's question here about Beethoven's influence on his uh, uh, contemporaries and, and so on. We also have another question, which we'll come back to after we listen to this piece, and that is from Satira Tenakorn. What differentiates composers like Beethoven, Mozart, and Vivaldi from the probably hundreds of lesser known composers who lived in the same periods? What distinguishes these great names from those who, you know, like Salieri and others who are now lesser known as a result? So think about that. And let's listen to it. Do you want to tell us very quickly uh, a couple of words about this song? Uh, uh, um, yeah, sure. I mean, just to clear the uh, what it what, what the song is about. It is about like a the, it starts with Heil Genacht, which means like the holy night. Uh, it seems like the narrator is actually in a good state of mind and is probably dreaming of better things than he experiences during his daytime like life as, as it uh, the reality of life so it's a it's almost a wish that the night doesn't go down and the moon doesn't go down and the dreams don't go down and stay where it is uh, so that he can enjoy this dreamy world for a little longer so that's basically the gist of the song uh, and it obviously is a is a german lead uh, uh, that obviously is sort of a precursor, like, you know, it, it sort of is found, the, you know, the back, backdrop can be of Beethoven too. So we can mm -hmm. talk about how, how the influence of leader yeah, uh, after, yeah. Thank you. So let's listen to this piece and then we'll come back.
Thank you, Taranga. That was, um, I mean, I, I, I really enjoyed the piece and, and the control you have over your voice is, uh, is actually uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> quite amazing. Um, now, we, we know that Beethoven, I mean, he did write this opera, the, the Fidelio, uh, you know, and of course, the famous Ninth Symphony, in which in the last moment you have uh, the soloists and the choir being kind of, for the first time, a composer introduces a choir and a soloists into a symphony. Uh, and then you have um, his Misa Solemnis, the Solemn Mass, uh, and also his Choral Fantasy and, uh, and so on. Um, and so he did write a fair amount of uh, vocal and choral music as well. And he did influence his contemporaries and generations of vocal music composers uh, who came after him. Uh, among them, of course, Schubert, Schumann, Brahms, Mahler, Wagner, Schoenberg, and even as recently as the last century, Michael Tippett, the British composer, just to, just to name a few. Now, how do you see this influence and how do you see the evolution of this influence over time of Beethoven and his music? And to tell us, uh, you can also speak a little bit about this particular piece and about Schubert and, and how you see that influence. Go ahead. Um, and this is uh, actually, before I answer, let me say that the pianist in that video uh, is uh, uh, Lisa Stepanova. She's uh, absolutely a brilliant pianist. And when I work with uh, pianists, like, you know, I'm constantly at awe and the idea of the collaboration, the cruciality of it, it it's never... Taranga, the soloist, and Lisa, something else, you know, it's, we are a duet. And when I sing with Rohan, it's the same. It's a duet. It's always a duet. And um, so going into um, the topic of the influence that Beethoven has had uh, in vocal repertoire, it's a, it's a little uh, difficult to sort of point at Beethoven as a great vocal composer because of, first of all, the, the, it's the compared to other composers, the, the, the volume of works is fewer or however great they may be, it's fewer. And so singers not shy away, but just have a lot other uh, options than going into Beethoven. So that's one of the reasons that a lot of singers have not necessarily explored Beethoven. But having said that, two things we cannot forget. One is the first one is the idea of song cycle or leader Christ, you know, so which is, which means like, you know, it's a set of songs that are primarily textually connected one to the next, and they're usually performed in the order that it's published. Uh, sometimes there may be some room to like switch songs around, but in ideal, you would sing it all in one go. Um, so that it's considered that undefended Geliebte, which is Beethoven, uh, is the first of all, uh, the song cycles ever. Uh, there is some debate about that could be someone else, but like uh, it's, it's established by Beethoven. And of course, if he had not done that, there won't be like Winterreise, Schubert, Dichter Lieber Schumann, uh, the Spanish Liederbuch uh, by Wolf, Mahler, Kindertotenlieder, none of those would be there if there was no song cycle. So Beethoven is key to have established this form of, uh, it's a huge deal in, in the vocal repertoire, right? Mm -hmm. So, and the other thing is, um, it's not necessarily about vocal uh, repertoire, but the idea of um, program music, you know, it did exist, like say Vivaldi, like the Four Seasons was, you know, it's full of program music because he, he's the, comp, the, the different seasons are uh, depicted by different sounds of instrumental instruments, uh, but it didn't really get established until Beethoven's Sixth Symphony. So uh, the, the between Vivaldi and Beethoven, uh, the sort of the absolute music, the idea of absolute music is what existed, which meant like music for the sake of music, like it was sort of like detached from, uh, the nuance and the details of uh, like depict, depicting a scene or imaginings. It was more like happy music, sad music, so a little bit more general up until Beethoven. And then Beethoven goes back, you know, in a way, respects the Baroque in a way and brings those elements and making it his own by using, you know, certain instruments to show the birds or the wind or, you know, by from there. And then of course, from that, 
like you know composers who are intimidated by Beethoven's presence and its works either embraced and challenged themselves to go ahead with what he had given to them or just ran in opposite direction that's kind of it seems to be the trend so uh, like Berlioz uh, or um, tone poems of Strauss all of that the source was like in a way the pathetic uh, sorry the the pastoral uh, the symphony so uh, so like you can see how like big ideas like program music or leader Christ, like it was given birth to in a fresh form by Beethoven and those kinds of like big revolutionary uh, pillar like moments created by certain uh, composers is the reason why they stand out in general and in Beethoven's case it's, it seems like he made a lot of those pillars so that he's sort of like uh, such a giant because of it. And I hope I answered the question. Um, you did, you did. I, and, and of course, I mean, if, as, as, if you look at the instrumental side, his symphonies, you know, the Ninth Symphony, many thought that no one could write more than nine symphonies. So they, they would die before you wrote the Ninth, ninth right. Symphony. Of course, Mahler, you know, uh, challenged that. And, uh, and of course, composers after that have challenged that. And, you know. And, all, and also, sorry, uh, I, if I may add, like, I feel like the way Beethoven uses the voice in particular is very much like he uses all the other instruments unlike like someone like Bellini or someone before like that who sort of elevates the voice over a lot of other things where the other instruments do sort of fall under the category of accompaniment but Beethoven treats the voice as equal to everything else or rather brings everybody else to the same plane or something like that there's a balance which I find very interesting and therefore even in his choral works whether it be the the Ninth Symphony or in the Mises Solemnis the way he uses it is not necessarily vocal friendly if I may say it's mm -hmm. actually quite um challenge yeah. for the voice I believe it's done on purpose because his goal is very different from like you know like when we usually think of a really good vocal writer is is someone who writes to, for the best and the sweetest part of your voice and it work fits well into the soprano fach or mezzo or whatever but he doesn't really it's not his thing he he wants it to be like a cry of humanity so it needs to be on the passaggio you know it, like he makes sure that it is uncomfortable and mm -hmm. that it is done out of it's, de it's deliberately done and uh, like when you sing joyful joyful you know like in German even but uh, so you would you're, you're actually it's more hope than the reality of the crowd mm -hmm. it's not actually about this joyful moment of brotherhood it's about the hope for it and mm -hmm. a cry of humanity so therefore he makes this whole chorus like cry out with on the top of their voices so you have to be very careful as a choir uh, a chorister or even as a soloist how to manage your vocalism there mm -hmm. even in Misa Solemnis terribly difficult credo of the Misa Solemnis the fugue the double fugue right. in which sopranos go up to top B I mean I, I, geez I, <laughs> top B is like all right you know and these are choristers who are asked to do this yeah. people in the choir they're not even like coloraturas or anything like that they're they're choir uh, sopranos when the challenge is to go up to that and uh, but we'll, we'll, we 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 are now about eight minutes over time so we have to end we will certainly have both of you again for a for another discussion i'm sure and but before we go we have to answer satira tenakon's question what is the what what is the thing that made it different that these composers the, the better known ones the Beethoven's the Mozart Vivaldi and so on uh, as a as you measure them against the lesser known composers um, what made what differentiates them what is it in their music that differentiates them from the lesser known composers who Ron, wants you to, want to say that? I think Taranga should do that one <laughs> <laughs> Talk too much. Give it to the lady. <laughs> uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. You're so good at this stuff. Um, is, it the well, quality, I mean, is it the quality of their music? I mean, what is it in there? Well, well, yes, that. And I also think that it's about making, like breaking some rules, you know, and being brave about it. I think that is the, the sort of the, it seems like the, the one thing that they all do you know and and no, i mean not just for the sake of breaking rules but in a way that it is something that they can't help 
but do. It's a, it's it comes from a very true place, you know, not just to be different, not to be different for the sake of it. Like you know, Picasso, you know, like he he was a very good realist painter, but he he felt that there was this other dimension that he had to explore. So it's like that's why he's he's considered a great. So I mean, that's if you take another entirely different. Um, uh, discipline, but the, all of these composers were those who broke the mold without even perhaps knowing that that's what they're doing and taking a chance, testing the water, see how the people react. So sometimes you're driving and you have your radio on uh, and you might be on a classical channel and you hear a piece, you, you tune in in the middle of the piece, you don't know what the piece is, there's nothing to show you the name or title or composer. And then you ask yourself, let me guess who this is. Mm -hmm. And you know, nine times out of 10, if you are, if you know your music, you get it right. Simply because you can at once say, this is definitely Beethoven, or this is definitely Vivaldi, or this is very much like Mozart. It could be a Haydn, it could be a Mozart, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and I think that is because each of these composers have a voice of their own that is unique, that is different. They have they have distinguished themselves with um, with a style that uh, that is their own, and and so my advice to young composers is find your own style, be different, do things differently, don't imitate others, don't try to be you. You can't be another classical composer, you can't be another Mozart, you can't be another Beethoven. You have to find your own voice, and to do that, you have to be authentic, speak from within your heart. And you're right, and that's it. when you do that, you may end up often breaking breaking the rules, and you're doing that, of course, with a purpose of wanting to speak your own voice. So, I think we have come to the end. Uh, Rohan, do you I have just one something? Last, just last, last very, word. Yes, go ahead. Just a, a very important point you said: have your own identity. I say that to some of these young, wonderful students uh, in New York. They, you know, they are so bombarded with the technology and you have all these uh, facilities that we never had, you know, uh, and everybody's listening to 10 people playing Beethoven concerto, whatever, the piece. And then they try to imitate, you know, and it sounds awful. I always say to them, who are you listening to? You know, then they will give a very well-known artist, some are, not alive anymore. And I'll say, you'll never sound like that person. So don't imitate, just get an idea of the work. And I think these young people, of course, with all these facilities available, they try to copy. Don't ever copy another person or any artist or a singer because you'll never sound like that person. However great they are. You're not going to be Yasha Heifetz. You never will be. There's only one Yasha Heifetz. There's only one Perlman, one Sukhman, you know, Ashkenazi or whoever, or, you know, uh, uh, Kiri Tekanawa, you know, the Jesse, you can't imitate Jesse Norman. I mean, it's fantastic. You know, the, so I think that was a very good point you made. And I'm sure Taranga would agree on that. It's just oh, a guidance. Yeah. Now bring something fresh. Uh, yes. of your own bring your identity. And if you, if you, if you can't, you know, as I say, if you to, to uh, I, I, you know, for, in public speaking, they say, if you don't have something, you know, uh, special to say, say, something new to tell people, don't, don't speak, just sit down, you know? So uh, uh, I, maybe that's a bit extreme, but I, I mean, for, for young musicians and composers, uh, that would be, I think, an important message. So let, uh, Taranga, did you want to say something or no? I mean, just to, I mean, not to discourage the young people, right? But like they, the first step to discovering themselves is not to find what is necessarily unique in them. Like that should not be their goal. No, they will no, discover so. it uh, over time. You have to be very patient with yourself and learn your stuff like you have to learn what's already what you have you inherited and if you don't know the the fundamentals that have been laid out to us by uh, the people before us and the current uh, educators whoever that's uh, there to mentor you i think uh, it is only after you have sort of gathered that information that you will know how to stretch it or push its boundaries because just to find your voice you can't just be in a way sort of rebellious that 
I don't need to know this stuff. I know the sound I want to create. You, you can't really do that successfully, I feel, if you are not backed up by the knowledge, especially in the today's world, because there is a lot of knowledge and information available to you. Uh, so uh, it's, it's very competitive. So if you end up having a little lack of understanding or knowledge of a certain area, the thing that you might think is unique may have been something that has already been discovered and dealt with by another. So you need to be really knowledgeable and seek for uh, or thirst for uh, the understanding of the subject at large. I mean, that, that's all I, I just wanted to. Oh, thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Taranga. And thank you also, Rohan. Uh, so this, we have to now bring uh, our program to an end. We are 14 minutes over time. And I think this has been a great discussion, fantastic, uh, um, covered a lot of ground. And um, we will have you both once again uh, at a later date uh, when we can talk a little bit more, particularly about the Sri Lankan music scene. I really like to tap your uh, thoughts on that, but we'll do that uh, another day. Um, once again, thank you very much for your time. And I know, um, you know, you're both busy people and Tarang, you're a parent as well. And so it's all not, not easy, but we really appreciate uh, your coming and uh, speaking with us today. Um, and also sharing your, 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 you know, musical excerpts with us. Uh, we are going to finish today's uh, program. Sorry, Rohan, did you want to say something? No, I just want to wish everyone a good night in the Asian continent. Indeed. And for those who are in Europe, a good evening and to all in the United States, have a great day. Indeed. And thank Indeed. you, Lalana. You're, yeah. you're talking to us from South Korea. I am. Yes, I am. it's very <laughs> late for you. It's, it's 1.40 in the morning here, but oh, that's, yeah, yes, I'm that's really it. excited about this conversation. Thank you for having us on this. Uh, thank I've you. Had a, yes. uh, it's such oh. an enjoyable time. Taranga, you are so wonderful. I learned a oh, lot of history uh, from you. It's a, it's a pleasure to like, you know, be sitting all together like this, you know, yes. it reminds me of Vietnam and... <laughs> yes, absolutely. And hopefully yeah. as the pandemic dies down, we'll, we hopefully have, we'll have another opportunity to yes. meet together and yes. perform together. So just before we finish, I want to say the recording of this program will be available on the Facebook page for anybody who missed it or wants to listen to it again, or wants to share it with somebody else. Um, and then our next program will be on the 20th, Saturday, the 24th of April, same time, 8.30 p.m. Indian Standard Time or Sri Lanka time, uh, and in the East Coast, 11 a.m. And we will focus this time, because it happens to be my birthday month, on my own compositions. And we will have with us uh, two lovely people who will come uh, uh, to join the panel to discuss the, the music. Uh, one is Madhu Parshani Disanayaka, who's, whom I've known for a long, long time, and she is um, as, uh, uh, teaching in the university, teaching English. Um, and um, uh, her husband, uh, Pradeep Ratnayaka, is this virtuoso sitarist for whom I wrote a uh, sitar concerto. And so we'll have her and we'll have also um, Vishnu Vasu, who's a, a percussionist, an oriental percussionist with whom I've worked in the past. The two of them will join us in, in a panel discussion. And so with that, we conclude, friends. Good night, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, and have a good day, good night for all of you in different parts of the world. Thank you for joining us, and uh, keep safe. See you all. Thank you, Rohan and Taranga. Thank you, Lala. Taranga, thank you. Thank you, Rohan. Thank you.